So let's see. Was it number six? Okay, so one or four? Here's number one. Did you just do that for everybody? Okay. No, no just kind of talked about it. Yeah. And then there's number four. Oops. Should we do this one? Yes. Okay, we'll do this one. Okay, so the, what you so obviously there's not going to be a table uh, table formula for four plus natural log x squared. That's a little specific, but it should be pretty obvious what we want to how we want to do a uh, change of variables here to make it something that there'll be a, a table formula for. So we'll say u equals what? Yeah. So the obvious first choice would be u equals natural log of x because why? We'd have 4 plus u squared. And we know that's our one of our common forms for these using these tables. a squared plus the variable squared. All right, so that if we do du, we get 1 over x dx. And if we're observant and we don't just start doing lots of algebra without looking, what do we notice? Well, um, Cross out the x's. I don't know about crossing out the x's, but right there is what we just found. 1 over x dx. And we just found that that equals to what? Yeah. du, right? So, so this is part of the integral. That is exactly part of the integral. So we just take that part of the integral and we replace it with du. So then this thing becomes 2 square root of 4 plus squared du. And we're done in terms of changing it into the variable u. So look for that. So um, don't get so caught up in, chain, in doing all this algebra in this part of when you're doing that, that you, you don't notice things like that. So we saw that in the last class too, that this, this kind of thing happens, where you'll do du, and what you get is exactly part of the integral. So you can just replace that part of the integral with du because they're equal. Okay? So now this... Uh, we can find that in the table, so let's see which one that is. Forms involving a squared, here we go. So we're going to look for what's just square root of a squared plus x squared. So that's the very first one, and that, and that, so is that this one right here? So 76. So let me put that. Let's see if I can. Let's see what I can do here. So I'll put that down there so we can see it. And then we're going to rewrite this one. So we know we have a 2. Two times. Okay, here we go. So it'll be, uh, it'll be u over 2. times the square root of 4 plus u squared plus 4 over 2 natural log of u plus square root of 4 plus u squared. So check, make sure I'm transferring everything correctly. I will add the plus c at the very end. So how did I do? Did I apply the formula correctly? Oh, but wait, we're going to have, it's going to be 2 times that whole thing. So this could have been problematic. It's 2 times that whole thing. And that might have been where some of you ran into difficulty. Did I make a mistake? So I was going to add the plus C at the very end after I changed back to X. Did, was there a question? So did I apply the formula correctly? u over 2 square root, then 4 over 2 natural log. But then that whole thing, both terms, multiplied by 2 because we have that 2 in ours. Are we good? So now I can, if I've done that right, I can 
get rid of my formula now. And now I've got to change this thing back into x, where every u is the natural log of x. So I'll go right to the, the uh, it's going to be 2 times parentheses, what, uh, natural log of x divided by 2. Um, times the square root of 4 plus natural log of x quantity squared, and do parentheses, and then plus 2 times natural log of x plus. Natural, oh, right, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. So 2 times natural log of, yeah. now, and then natural log of x, and I might have to do absolute value there, do I need absolute value there? Here. Okay, uh, plus square root of uh, 4 plus natural log x squared. Undo those parentheses. Undo those parentheses. And undo another set of parentheses. So let's let's take a look. Let's uh, preview. Yeah, missing close parentheses. Is there a th fourth one? Put three. Okay. So is this the right thing? Two times natural log of x over u four plus. That's terrible notation. All right, plus 2 times natural log of natural log of x plus 4 plus x. Okay, so I, I think this is what, we, what I intended, what I wrote here in the blue, I, with, a, with a natural log of x substituted in for every u up here. I think, I think that's the right thing. So that, did I miss something? Oh, question, sorry. Let's see. Uh, right. So, right. So, so because in this, in the in the in the rate function itself, the domain is only x greater than zero in the first place. So you wouldn't need absolute value. That's true. But it won't make it wrong if you include it. But you're right. You don't. You you don't need it because the domain of your rate function is only x greater than zero. So then, that's you don't need the absolute values. But good point. Other questions? So yeah, that's a hard, I can see why that's a hard transfer to get the parentheses right on that. So that could throw you off. And I'm actually a little leery here that I still didn't get it quite right, but we can check. Okay, that's right. Okay, questions on that one or just tables in general? Yes, please. Say it again? Like if you simplified it, so instead of getting the antiderivative of 2 times the square root of 4 plus u squared, uh -huh. just turn that into 2 times 2 plus u. No, the square root of a plus b is not square root of a plus square root of b. Yeah, you can't, you can't, not with plus, right? So you're trying to do, you're trying to do this. That's no, that's not, that's not true. Am I understanding your question right? Okay. Other questions? Okay, so let's move on to the next topic. And reminder, our exam, oh, let me show you on Blackboard all the, the stuff I put up, if you haven't noticed it yet.
So our exam is a week from today. I put up exam prep and homework solutions. Homework solutions I haven't um, released yet, but I have um, done this so this much so far. First thing is there's in terms of all these integral techniques. So this first link doesn't include all the fundamental mm -hmm. theorems we did on the first couple days, which is really important. But since then we've been doing all these integral techniques, and so lots of good practice problems in this list. Notice that you're not responsible for certain ones on there. Okay, so this there's a list down here below of problems from that uh, practice integral problems link that you, you're not responsible for. Okay, so make sure you notice that. And then the, there's the review outline. That's this third one in the list. So there's nothing on the exam that's not mentioned here. Okay, everything on the exam is related to these bullet points of things you need to understand and be able to do, okay? And then what we'll do, kind of split in terms of uh, memorizing identities, so I'll kind of, this is kind of the compromise that I come up with, is that on the, on the first page of the exam, on the cover sheet, I will give you this, okay? And before you take the exam, you'll just fill this out and it'll be for a bonus point on the exam. So if you want, if you do this, you get a bonus point. And then you'll have all the you'll have all the formulas, okay? And so and then I posted the the completed version along with that. So there's there it is all completed. And then, like I said, you'll on the first front page will look like this, and you'll fill those in. You get your plus one, and then you don't have to worry about. And you can use this as a reference throughout the exam, okay? So that's kind of my compromise on terms of. Memorizing the, having to memorize the identities, okay? Uh, so for, no derivative rules will be given, but then I just explain this part about the trig identities. Okay, and then I, so then I owe you uh, homework solutions, which I'll release in this same area here, the exam prep homework solutions for all that written work that we did at the beginning. So you had all those um, written assignments that we turned in, yeah? I also get plus the solutions to the practice and the no. So what we'll do is, if you have, if you want to, um, if you have certain ones that you that you have questions about, you can do office hours or email me. But I, yeah, I don't, I don't have um, solutions to those. So I went. So and then, okay. And a lots of those, since they're antiderivatives, how can you check to see if you're right? And that was the way we learned it anyway, right? So a lot. So for lots of these. That's not what I wanted. Lots of those practice problems, we did it all based on derivatives. So if you want to see if you're right, you could take the derivative. Okay, but don't hesitate. Office hours, email us questions. You can discuss them on Piazza. Put them up on Piazza. Email us or come to office hours and we'll answer all your questions. Um, for integral tables on the test, are we going to just bring a textbook? No, so I would provide you with uh, the tables or part of the tables that you would need to find the right one. Yeah, so absolutely, and that's the whole point of those that you, you're you using these tables that you have. So I'd have to provide, somehow provide you with the right table formula if that's on there, yeah. So we need to bring calculators to the test? Yeah, so you should have a, a, oh, let's see, is this the one where I just, is the first exam where I just wanted them to do a, that? just a scientific, yeah, so okay, so I'm glad you mentioned that. So for the exam, uh, we're not, I'm not going to allow graphing calculators. So you just have to get a cheap scientific calculator or borrow one. You can buy one for like $8, a new one. Or you can just borrow one, or many of you probably already have one. So no graphing calculators, but you can have a scientific calculator. Okay? And you probably won't need it. Uh, I don't remember. If you do, it'll only be for a couple questions. A lot, most of them are not like calculation intensive. Um, so you're going to be doing, I, I would guess that, that you would be working on a lot of these. Yeah. Yeah. So this will be good. You can work through lots of those together and a good, so, uh, good practice is just go through each one and, and identify because that's another skill you have to have. These are all jumbled up now. So you, you have to have this added skill of not only being able to do each type, but 
know which, what type it is, right? So uh, identification is a, a skill you're going to have to have on the exam as well. So because these are all mixed up, there's good practice in that as well. Okay, anything more to say about the exam? I'm just planning on answering questions that everyone asked. Yeah, but so for those who didn't, I guess it's, it would take the place of that. So if you didn't have recitation on Monday because of Labor Day, um, in, in Wednesday's recitation, you guys did lots of these, right? So yeah, so it'd be good if you to stay after class and kind of uh, have that advantage that the Wednesday recitation people have. Okay. And so there's one more topic uh, that is covered on the exam that we start today. Are we ready to do that? Any more questions? So that topic is called improper integrals. OK, so improper integrals brings us back to uh, Conceptual ideas, right? So we've been on a couple weeks now. We've been in this very algebraic mode, formulas, recipes, how to how to you know move the symbols around and get answers. But and uh, so but within proper integrals, there's a there's a whole conceptual side to it that we want to really understand here. So consider a rate of change function that is always positive. For example, a population that grows by two thousand people per year. Okay, so you have a rate of change of 2,000 per year for some population. So let's think about the quantity, um, i.e., what will happen if the population has this rate indefinitely? So what will happen to the quantity of the population in this case if just indefinitely it has this rate of change of 2,000 people per year? What's that? Growing linearly. Okay, um, and then in the, in the long run, kind of what, what will the result? Yeah, it will just keep growing and growing and growing without bound, right? So there will be no, no stop to how large the population gets. It will get as large as you want it to get as long as you wait long enough, okay? Okay, so the prop population will grow infinitely large because 2,000 people is added every year for an ongoing number of years. So. So what am I, here's I'm showing you a graph here. What graph am I showing you relative to this situation? What graph? It's the rate of change graph, right? So no matter what, how many years have gone by, you get that same rate of change of 2,000. So then what will the quantity, the population function look like? Draw with your finger. Just up and up and up and up, right? As time goes by, it, that's the same thing we just talked about. OK, so that's, that's a good start. So then let's consider this rate function. All right, so what about this rate function? Rx is 1 over x cubed uh, from x equals 1 to infinity. Okay, what was that? Uh, as x increases, it's going to get closer and closer to 0. What's it? What, what's I'm uh, sorry, uh, the, you know, the outcome, the function. But what function? So remember, in the, in the, when I just, th that population thing, where there was two different functions going on there. So I just want to clarify. The rate of change function. The rate of change function. So now he's saying um, the rate of change function is going to get small, right? It's going to, it's going to um, get approach zero. approach zero for large values of x. OK, but what about just versus positive, zero, and negative? What about this rate function in terms of positive, zero, or negative? Is it? Sometimes positive, sometimes negative, sometimes zero, always negative. 
All right, yes, it's always positive, right? So this is always positive. So again, if, if this was some rate of change of population, which is always positive, what will become of the actual population if time <coughs> is just allowed to continue indefinitely? So in is it always still growing? Like just like small amounts? Okay. So Okay, so always positive means that, that that population will always be growing. Would you agree with that? It's always going to be increasing. It might be. Okay, so we might so we might think um, like the last example is like okay, is it going to get is going to get really big? So that seems logical, right? It seems normal. So how can we test that? So we can say. Um, So looking at how, what do we have now to find the value of a quantity, say? If I've got a rate function, how do I find the value of quantity or the change in the quantity? Yeah, so we do integral from 1 to infinity of that rate function, right? And so this is going to be the total change, the total change in this quantity, whatever it is, whose rate is 1 over x cubed as x starts at 1 and just increases forever, right? It just increases forever. All right, so now we can't, you can't plug infinity into something, but you can, you can look at a limit. So what we do for these is we, we say, let's look at the limit as A gets really big and then do the integral from 1 to A. So don't, don't try to plug infinity into things, right? Evaluate limits as that value gets really large without bound. That's that's the way we think of it. But we don't plug in infinity because really you never really get there. Okay, so uh, so we just look at the limit if it were possible to get there. Right? What would it reach? Okay, so what is this antiderivative? So this is x to the minus three. So antiderivative is it's like we die for these right at this point so minus two minus one half. Right, and then from one to a, and I forgot the limit. So we still want the limit as a goes, a gets large. Okay, so then we have limit as a increases of negative one half. Let me put the to a squared, right, uh, minus negative 1 over 2 times 1. So I do the math right? Okay, so now we're ready to evaluate this limit. As a gets really, really big, what happens to negative 1 over 2 a squared? Yeah, minus negative, that's not it. That, is that better? That's better. Okay. So, as A gets really, really big, what about negative 1 over A squared? Goes to 0. And let's, so when, when does, when does this go to 0? Limit, so as a side note, so let's just, because we maybe need this later. Limit as x goes to infinity, 1 over x to the r, equals 0 when what? Remember this limit from Calc 1? So 1 over x to the r equals 0. When r is greater than 1. Okay. What about if, what about if r was 1 half? 1 over the square root of x. It will get big, and so therefore it still goes to zero. Yeah. So it's really when r is anything greater than zero. As long as r is positive, that exponent is positive, this will eventually get very, very big, and that ratio will, will be zero. So that's just a, like a little side note. It's an important fact.
important fact is that if you have one or something of the form of one over x to the r, that will get really, really small, just as long as r is positive. r can be any positive number, and that will get really, really small. Okay, back to this, and so we're seeing that here. So that's this here. R is two, so certainly that will get that denominator will get big, and that ratio will be zero. And so then this doesn't care what a does; it's just always what one half. So I thought that if the rate was positive. The rate was positive, we'd always be increasing in our quantity, and so it would just whirl off to infinity. But what does the math tell us? Okay. In this case, that didn't happen, right? So somehow, even though we accumulated at a positive rate forever, we still got a finite amount. Did you see it? Did you hear what I said? So we are accumulating at a positive rate, which means an increasing quantity, forever, for, for indefinitely, and we get a finite amount. In fact, it's kind of small finite amount, one half. Okay, so what's going on here? Shouldn't it, shouldn't it whirl off to infinity? Shouldn't it get really big? In, uh, adding, like, at some point further than the like, decimal place is previously, Okay. such that like, if you added 0.1, uh, or if you added 0.01 to 0.1 uh, and then 0.001 to that, mm -hmm. uh, you're never going to increase um, in like a after a certain amount. Right, so it has to do with the amount that your quantity goes up each time is shrinking rapidly, right? And that's because what about the rate function? What's making this true? Yeah, so the rate function is always positive, but it's it's getting really close to zero. So virtually you're, you're adding such a small amount at, at, su at, at a certain point that you're not really increasing hardly at all to that it, can't, it just won't, it, it won't ever grow bigger than a half. Okay, and so the limit is one half. So let's look at that. Uh, let's, let's, uh, okay, does that make sense? Okay, so let's look at another example, 1 over x. So you may have to rewrite it on your notes, but I'm going to cheat and just kind of change this. So I'm going to... So let's look at 1 over x. It's similar to 1 over x cubed, right? Because what happens to that rate as x gets large? It's going gonna, it's gonna, right, to get close to 0, but it, it's always positive. So we know we'll always be increasing, and in the quantity will always be increasing. But that rate is going to get really small, so the amount that it's increasing by is going to keep shrinking. Okay, So let's do the math for this one. So I'm going to do now my rate is going to be 1 over x, always positive, x from 1 to infinity. So I'm going to, my quantity will be the integral from 1 to infinity, 1 over x dx. And I'm going to take that limit as a gets large. I'm going to rewrite that. And so, so by the way, when you have, when you have uh, infinity involved in an integral, that's, that's the idea of improper integral. Right? So that, that's improper integral means somehow something somewhere is getting infinitely large. That's implied by the integral. So what is this? So the integral includes implication of infinite. That's a lot of I words. Somehow, some part of the integral is has an implication of infinity. Okay, that's what an improper integral is. Okay, and so now, what is our so when, so when we do the antiderivative, natural log. natural log, and then we're going to evaluate that from one to a. So we get natural log of a. 
minus natural log of 1. Okay, and now we evaluate this. So you need to know something about the natural log function. Maybe you can have an image of its graph. As A gets really, really big, what does natural log do? Yeah, so this... This gets really big, so this this has no limit. As a gets really big, natural log gets really big. Okay, so what happened? We had kind of the same situation. So now now we're back to the, what we kind of thought at the beginning when you've got this positive rate and it's positive forever. And so you think the quantity is going to get big? Well, we saw that if the rate goes to zero, it doesn't. It's, it was a finite value, the quantity. Well, now the rate's going to zero and it's positive, and it's an infinite amount. So what's going on here? So we do the math on this one, and we get this. This uh, the quantity now just grows and never stops growing, whereas before it leveled off. Okay, so let's take let's let's look at some graphs of this. It will help. Any questions on what's written up there before I get rid of it? Okay. So, so here's that first rate function. Red for rate. Okay. So here's the first rate function. This was our rate function that was 1 over x cubed. And that, again, from 1 indefinitely, right? So x greater than or equal to 1. OK, and so if we were to think about the quantity function here, what would you expect, based on the math that we did, what would you expect the quantity function to look like? Okay, but what's the what's the key to it? So as x gets really really big, what's going to happen to that quantity function? Level off, right? So we'll do blue. And if I zoom out on the x-axis, what am I going to see? Essentially, so for really really large x, that quantity is essentially what? So now I'm in the 10,000s, now I'm in the 100,000s, no, not yet. Here's the 100,000s, and what is this showing me? What did we find? The total amount of the quantity is 1 half, right? We've got that number 1 half, and that's showing you. So for really, really big, large x, it just basically gets essentially as close as you want to 1 half until it's indistinguishable from 1 half, right, for big enough x. Okay, what about the other one? So what was the other one? We had... Let's do purple for that one. Okay, so here is... The second rate function, we'll call that rate 1. So that was our rate 1. And that is rate 2. And that was 1 over x, same thing. x greater than equal to 1. And if we think about the quantity function for that one, what are we going to expect that to look like? Draw it with your finger. Does it level off? No, what do we find? So let's uh, zoom out a little bit on the y-axis there. So the blue one, leveling off at 1 half, if the rate's 1 over x, it's just going to keep growing and growing and growing, right? So look at the two rate functions and tell me why this is happening. So they, d d both these rate functions get very, very close to 0. Their limits, both limit, rate functions have a limit of 0 as x gets very large. 
So why does one of them have a quantity function that levels off no matter how x gets uh, x, how big x gets, and the other one that just the quantity just keeps growing and growing and growing? Can you see what's happening here? Yeah. Is that what, someone else had a hand up over here? So do you see one over x cubed? Look at that rate. What happens? It just gets really small, really quick. You see that? So yeah, it's exactly right. It's like the rate at which the rate gets to zero. How fast does the rate get to zero? For one over x cubed, it gets really small, really quick. And so by you know by seven here, it's in this scale, it's like indistinguishable from zero. Whereas 1 over x, it like hovers a lot higher. It takes a lot longer. It takes a lot more of x to, to get small. And so it's hovering higher. And because of that, the rate is staying much higher. And so that's the reason why. Um, that's the reason why this, uh, when you have 1 over x, that quantity just increases indefinitely, but if you have 1 over x cubed, the rate gets so small so quick that that quantity levels off. Really important idea. But what about, so remember our, when our rate of change was 2,000? Could a rate function like that ever have a chance of, of having a finite quantity, a constant rate like that? No, so what, what's required, what's necessary for a quantity to level off? What about the rate? Yeah, the rate of change has to approach zero. If the rate of change doesn't approach zero, if it's something else, then, you're, then your quantity is just going to keep growing and growing at whatever rate it ends up at. So you, it has to be, so what's necessary is that rate approaches zero. But is that enough? Is that sufficient that the rate approaches zero? No, I'm showing you an example where that's not enough. So yes, the rate has to get to zero, but also has to get to zero fast enough. So it's a necessary condition that a rate of change function has to get to zero in order for the quantity to be finite. Okay? But that's necessary, but that's not sufficient. That's not enough. The, the, that rate of change function also has to get to zero fast enough. Okay, so um, how fast? So where's the where's the cutoff? Right, we got one over x cubed and one over x. Somewhere in here, there's like a cutoff. Okay, so let's show where the cutoff is. Where is the cutoff? Where that that separates out rate functions that do get there fast enough versus ones that don't. Okay. So for that, we can do, we can just say, all right, let's just do an arbitrary p. And we're trying to find out for what values of p does this integral exist, and for what values of p does the integral just blow up? OK, so we take the limit. I'm going to do this kind of fast, OK? So we're to the limit as a goes to infinity of 1 to a x to the minus p dx, which is the limit. So what are we going to have? We're going to have x to the minus p plus 1 over minus p plus 1, and that from 1 to a. OK, so that equals the limit as a goes to infinity of 1 over, let's just factor that out, times, so this is 1 over x to the 1 minus p. No, p minus 1. Right? 
So if it's x to the minus p plus 1, that's 1 over x to the p minus 1. So I just took the opposite of the exponent and put it in the denominator. So it would be easier for us to analyze. Okay, so it's going to be limit as a goes to infinity. 1 over negative p plus 1 times 1 over x to the a minus 1 minus 1 over... Sorry, I put the wrong thing in. A to the p minus 1 minus 1 over 1 to the p minus 1. Okay, have I done, have I, is the math right? So the question is, where, when does this limit exist? So it really comes down to this right here. The limit as a goes to infinity of that, because that's the only thing that has a in it. <laughs> So when does the limit a goes to infinity of 1 over a to the p minus 1 equals 0? And this is the fact that I told you before. When p minus 1 is what? When greater than 0. Right? That was that r, right? That was that fact I showed you before. And so that's when p is greater than 1. So this limit will exist. We'll get, a, we'll get a finite value when p is greater than 1. And when p is less than 1, less than or equal to 1, less than or equal to 1, this thing blows up. So does that agree with what we found? So we had 1 over x cubed. That's a p greater than 1. And then we did 1 over x to the just x, which is p equal to 1. So this thing is finite whenever p is greater than 1. So what's the breaking point? 1 is the breaking point. We did the example where p was equal to 1. And that, that's, the, that's actually the first, that's the first one, that's the, the first value of p that it won't get, it, the rate won't get to 0 fast enough for the quantity to converge at a finite value. So anything less than, anything like 1 or less than 1, so if this was 0.75 or 0.1, but anything greater than 1, so if this, if this exponent is 1.00001, then this thing will converge to a finite value, and you can find that finite value by just evaluating the integral, okay? By evaluating that integral. But you can know ahead of time, if, you, if it's of this form, you can know ahead of time if it's going to be a finite amount or not, just by looking at value of p, if it's greater than 1. Okay, but there's, this is a very narrow, right? This is a very narrow class of improper integrals. 1 over x to the p. That's a, that's a very specific integral. So what about other, other examples? So of ones that aren't of those form, 1 over x to the p. Well, so we don't have necessarily have a way of looking at it right away and saying, yes, it will be finite or, or it will blow up. But we just do the math. We do the math. And then if we get infinity, we know that the, the rate function does not get to 0 fast enough. If we get a finite value, then we say, okay, that rate function got to zero fast enough. Okay? Sure. Yeah? Um, does the lower bound necessarily have to be one? No. Any yeah. So, yeah. Any, any, this could be any positive value. Yeah, sorry. Any positive value? Um, it's all okay. Yeah, any, any positive value. So, what? Uh, if it's negative, then, uh, then you're going through an undefined. Then it becomes a different kind of improper integral. So, so, because then the range of values is going through zero, where this is this is undefined. So yes, yeah, so this is a, so b or b is greater than zero. So you, yeah, you can start at any positive value. Okay. All right. So let me just show you a different type because, like I said, this is a very narrow class of functions. We'll see a lot of these in proper integrals, but then we'll see others also. So we want to try this. Yeah, please. Minus p minus 1, 
Mm -hmm. So, so just want, how about after class? Can you show me an after class, and we'll, okay. we'll we'll settle it after class. What's that? Isn't there a degree rule with this? If, like the highest degree of the exponent of the numerator is higher than the one at the bottom, then it's positive. Maybe I'm not a rules kind of guy. <laughs> Sorry, but maybe there's something like that. I don't know. All right. Uh, so here's one. It's different, right? So it does not follow that form. It doesn't match that form of 1 over x to the p. Certainly not. And also, it's this is kind of weird. It's like different, right? So this one is looking at a rate function that looks like this. So what is 3x e to the 1 half x? Uh, what does that look like? That looks like something like this. I think. Pretty decent, pretty close. OK. So uh, yeah, so the question is, uh, maybe so. so what is this saying? This is saying, if the rate was from negative infinity up to negative 2, then would that converge? So, so we have that necessary condition of, at negative infinity, this thing is approaches 0. So we have the necessary condition, but is it sufficient? And how do we find that out? We do the math. So we do the limit as a goes to infinity of negative a. Or we do a to negative infinity and do positive a. That's fine. Either way. Okay, and so now we have to evaluate this antiderivative. Oops, one half x. Okay, so how do we evaluate that antiderivative? X times e to the something x. Yep. So you know, if you remember that's one of our common forms for undoing the product rule. So you have to do the math for undoing the product rule. And then once you get the antiderivative, you're going to evaluate that limit as a gets very large negative. And if you get a if you get a value, so you're going to get right. So you're going to have like remember this f times g minus the integral of uh, g prime f prime g. So you're going to have that whole expression, and you're going to evaluate that, and you're you're going to have that whole expression evaluated from a to negative two, and then the limit as a goes to negative infinity. If that is a finite limit, then what? This, this rate function got to zero fast enough, and this thing has a definite value of a quantity. If, you, if the limit doesn't exist, if you get infinity, then it didn't get to zero fast enough. Then, then that rate function, although it got to zero, it didn't get there fast enough, and you have a, a, um, an undefined improper integral. We do not have time to do that fast anyway. OK, so does the roadmap make sense for this problem? You're going to undo the product rule. You're going to get an expression of two terms. You're going to evaluate that from a to negative 2. And then you're going to evaluate that limit as a goes to negative infinity. If you get a finite value, then the quantity, that original quantity, that change in that quantity is finite. And if the limit blows up, then this is this improper integral does not exist or diverges. Yeah, so so there's this language as you back up, converges or convergent and divergent. Converges means the quantity is a finite quantity, although we're we're evaluating the rate for an infinite amount. Diverges means it blows up. It does not exist. Okay? OK, so uh, we just have uh, standard web work for Monday. And then get started studying. You've got those, uh, the study resources I've posted so far. Okay.